Welcome to Newsmakers, featuring insight analysis and behind the scenes commentary on the most important news events in our community from Santa Barbara's top journalists and local political leaders. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we'll look behind these headlines, shock and outrage at San Marcos High in a case of cyber threats and bullying. The campaign for supervisor ramps up amid battling over gender politics. After years of delay, South Coast commuter rail service is finally due to arrive, and activists are forced yet again to organize against California offshore drilling. Our panel tonight, school board member and nonprofit consultant Laura Capps. Kelsey Brueger, national affairs correspondent for the Santa Barbara Independent. Josh Molina, political reporter who writes for Newshawk, and Nick Welsh, executive editor of the Indy. Thank you all for being here. So, Laura, this case at San Marcos has been going on for a couple weeks, and you haven't been able to talk about it because there's federal laws and other things, but tonight... I'm going to break the laws. <laughs> I not. see they were break the laws. That prohibit you, but there was a, uh, a school board meeting where parents... Yes. Uh, apparently of some of the victims uh, were able to address the board. Uh, and basically a group, a small group of upperclassmen put some stuff online, threatening mm -hmm. and insulting uh, a larger group of uh, uh, female students. Female students. So what, what, what did you hear? I hear the fear. I mean, then to have this happen uh, recently and then have the, one, a mass shooting today, uh, yesterday in Florida. It's just, it's very, the, the fear is what um, the parents wanted to convey. And unfortunately, um, thankfully, no one was hurt. Thankfully, somebody reported this online chat, uh, this private chat to assistant superintendent, super uh, assistant principal at San Marcos High School. And the right protocols were put in place in terms of sheriff's office starting an investigation. Um, but communication could have been better, and that's really what we're hearing now. And, so, and we've, uh, we're, we're reacting and acting now. Um, but you know, you brought up the law. Um, part of the frustration amongst parents was, I mean, the real basis of fear that this is happening right here in our community. And it's not just San Marcos. The the, the students involved directly were San Marcos, but other females who were named were at, were at different campuses. So it's really a a, a district issue. But um, you know, they were met with sort of, the parents initially were kind of met with some bureaucratic answers uh, that A, we can't talk about disciplinary action because it's against federal law since these students uh, who made the video are minors, and B, from the law enforcement side of things, that they were told, oh, there's no immediate threat, right. which sounds like, don't worry about it, yet this is, we know we have an epidemic of gun violence in this country, and so of course they're going to worry about it. What the sheriff's office was trying to communicate was that they had determined quickly that the that the students, the boys, didn't have any access, immediate access to firearms. Although there was, I guess, go ahead. Yeah, how, how did they, they make that determination? I mean, did they actually go in and search the homes? Because, what if, I mean, obviously you can see where guns are registered, but people often have guns that aren't registered. Right. Yeah, and that's another source of frustration of, you know, the, you know just the rawness from Elliot Rogers and, and the shooting and killing at UCSB that, that you know, people went, authorities went to his home too, right? right. So, so uh, that doesn't necessarily satisfy uh, a very real fear that parents have about what's happening. I don't know how the sheriff's office did, made that determination, but that was the mess, the initial message that was given was basically not not it, the result was sort of like don't worry about it right and uh we regret that the superintendent has apologized and has really you know doubled down on efforts to communicate we have a website now sbunified.org safety with all of the new protocols up uh, retweaked protocols about communication and and all of our safety plans and just communities is now on campus um adl what is that? um that's a um, civil rights organization to work on um, bullying and uh, misogyny and racism and so they they're trained um, Jared Schwartz they're trained to teach work with teachers and work with students and the anti-defamation league are working with uh, on campus so well, we're taking this very seriously uh, but unfortunately the students uh, the teachers had uh, excuse me the parents had a right to be frustrated with the initial communication that that happened initially 
And your role as a school board member in this is? You, you, you kind of have to be separated. I know there well, was yeah, an I mean, earlier meeting with the superintendent. Sure, were... right, yeah. The, they had a, a town hall at San Marcos High School. Uh, 200 parents showed up. Uh, the sheriff's office uh, deputy um, conducted that alongside Superintendent Matsuoka. We were not uh, able to attend because it, it, the school board, if they had shown up, it would have been a Brown Act violation. So really what we're, um, where we'll take the most active role is if there's any funding that is, um, you know, if, if we actually do put in a, um, a student resource officer at San Marcos, which is another issue. Um, but probably most importantly, when the disciplinary action against these students works its way through the process, ultimately it will come to the board, um, and that's our role. And that's the part we, that we can't talk about out of respect for the fact that they're minors. But what about I mean, the idea of a school resource officer? How effective is a school resource officer against a threat like this, yeah. where you have people are doing their chat room, uh, you know, gun bay well, right. and, and there was a... And not, nothing happened at school, and that's right. an important point in, the, in terms of how could a student resource officer prevented anything when this video was not made at school and none of this actually act, took place at school. I, that remains to be seen for me. I, I'm um, getting educated on student resource officers. There's a lot of uh, uh, opinions on both sides of the issue and whether or not you know they actually are helpful or we heard definitely from a lot of activists that um, who are very who, who against were the, the po Poder is against a student resource officer being placed Why? back at San Marcos. They say it's a pipeline to prison. Uh, the studies all show that it leads to more arrests of uh, of people of color. Wow. Well, there was a school resource officer at this case in Florida this week. Oh yeah. And didn't do anything because it wasn't at the same place where the person was. So yeah. Do you have any idea um, what the reaction has been by students at San Marcos? I mean, do you have any sense of you know sort of the range of reaction? Oh, they were just making uh, a kind of a sick joke and get over it. Who uh, you know were really scared and are people not going to school? Yeah, I mean, I've heard a, I've heard a range. I know. Um, I know a, particular, a friend of mine is her daughter was one of the um, girls listed on this video, and uh, it's it's. I mean, she didn't know whether or not to send her daughter to school, and I would be asking the same questions as a parent. I think it's a range. I think that um, the, there was good fair, the communication to the parents who were directly involved, uh, the families that were directly involved of the girls, but the but news trickled out sort of haphazardly amongst the rest of the campus, which I think was a problem. Um, and so people are sort of mo mostly reacting to getting sort of bits and pieces of information as opposed to. But now that's been that's been rectified and, and um, good communication and clear commu communication is going out. All right. Kelsey, speaking of sexism in our community, uh, so the second district supervisor seat has been held by a Democratic woman for 20 years. And 20 more than that. Well, Sheila, or uh, uh, Jean uh, Graffy before that. She's a Republican, though. But, but So I'm just saying. Right, Democratic. no, it's been a long time. But the Democrats endorsed Greg Hart, imperiling that streak. Are, are gender politics going to fracture the, uh, the party? Well, they are now that we have a blogger in this community who has <laughs> decided that that's the... No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, just of the course, facts. Just no, the facts. Right, Kelsey. right. Well, you know, I think... Um, there was an endorsement at the, like you mentioned, at the uh, Democratic uh, Central Committee about two weeks ago, and both candidates, Susan Epstein and Greg Hart, spoke, uh, gave a speech, were able to answer a couple of questions, um, and uh, Greg succeeded with the endorsement, um, just getting the 60% threshold um, that he that he needed. 61.23. <laughs> right. I think I also read that on the blog. Um, and, and so, or as spam, as Josh <laughs> likes to call it. Right. Uh, I, I don't clear my spam till the end of the week, so I'm looking forward to reading your story. <laughs> That's a Friday night activity. Uh, Josh is trying to mansplain Kelsey. Please continue. <laughs> um, so uh, he, you know, according to the Democratic Central Committee, he succeeded in getting this endorsement. Um, like you said, you know, the seat has always been held by a wim woman. Um, I have heard grumblings after the, the vote that, um, you know, uh, the, the Dem, there's, it's, a, it's a complicated sort of very wonky issue of clubs and how this vote happens, but the Dem women, um, you know, they abstained and it's a little bit unclear. I think there's maybe a different interpretation of Robert's rules 
um, about uh, you know how the vote takes place. You know when they make their when when they vote and uh, if they're part of that decision. So short answer is you know Dem women, which this is a race as you say a man and a woman. It's been held by a woman. The seat has been held by a woman for uh, more than 20 years, and they didn't have a role in this very crucial endorsement. Um, at the same time, you know as I think you also pointed out. Um, Greg has been made it known that he's been, you know, kind of stepped aside in the past for um, a seat, for instance, in the assembly. You know, uh, Monique Limon has that seat now, and, you know, there was always talk that he was interested in that seat and, um, and didn't challenge her. Um, but this is the second high profile race within a year where this has happened in, uh, in the Kristen Snedden race, where mm -hmm. you had. Jim Scafidi. <laughs> From your state of Ohio. Jim Landslide Scafidi, endorsed by, uh, by the, party. the party. And then Kristen Snedden got all the women, uh, Democratic women, uh, to, to support her. What, 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 I mean, what do you think? Is this fracturing the party? I hope not. I hope that we, I mean, I, we have two good Democrats. I'm supporting Susan Epstein along with my school board colleagues. Uh, but we have two good Democrats, and I hope it doesn't fracture. It shouldn't, right? But, I mean, we live in Santa Barbara, and we live in California, so Dem, Dems are going to run against each other. And it feels like, oh, yeah, it's just on the heels of it, but I think it's always kind of on the heels of it because we go through, you know, these, these tough races uh, with good Democrats. I mean, thankfully, we have good Democrats. But, yeah, I mean, it, it is sort of following some of the lines of the, of, of the Snedden race with most of the Democratic women lining up behind Susan Epstein. But isn't it a fact, Josh, that the Democratic Party nominally is in favor of electing more women, of increasing the, 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 the paltry number of women in office? But yet, when it comes to actually acting on this, your friends in the Democratic uh, apparatchik uh, administration don't, don't do anything. You'd well, agree with that, wouldn't you? I think that diversity and inclusion is a platform of the Democratic Party. And so, yes, they are going to look for strong female candidates. And they have a record of... Except help. when they have one. <laughs> they have a record of backing strong female candidates. Some of them win, some of them don't. Most recently, um, it, they have not been successful in city council races. Um, here's the thing, okay. The most qualified person from the Democratic Party's perspective, was Greg Hart. Oh, because come on, the fix was in. That was, Greg, didn't, didn't, uh, Greg Hart has been around since the 90s. And okay. Duraka promised him this endorsement, and he got it. Well, as you know, it was a close vote. So, But here, here's the thing. Yes, the, the, the thing is Susan Epstein is very qualified. She has a lot of support. She's got a great pedigree. She's a totally formidable candidate. Greg Hart's been around a little bit longer, and they feel like he's done a little bit more for the party, supporting certain candidates, running, waiting, and uh, you know, he got the vote. It's going to be close. It's not going to be a runaway for Greg. Well, you gave me four points. Let's keep that in mind. You, you picked Greg minus four. We can look at the tape if you'd like. Greg is the favorite, okay? Greg is the front runner, but a lot can Based happen. Based on what? A lot can happen between... Based on Josh. <laughs> a lot can happen between now and then. Uh, Greg's a front runner because he's got a longer lineage of history of community uh, service. Right? He's he's done more. He's been around. He's been on the close. So he's commission. better known. He, he's probably has yeah. more name recognition. Oh, wait, yeah, much more name wait, recognition. Wait, 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 what's the in, breakdown again? How in much Galita, is in Goleta? In Goleta, I don't in, know. How much is in Goleta in the city of Santa Barbara? Not much is in the city of Santa Barbara. I right. mean, it's like down by the waterfront, right? you know, there's um, that area, but it's mostly Goleta. And, and on Incorporate, right? So yeah. she's yeah. Well. yeah, no, and well. no Lita. You know, I think it's going to break down much more uh, Goleta, Santa Barbara than it is going to mm -hmm. be gender. And I think that if Susan can get the uh, county firefighters, that would be a huge endorsement. It would make, it would trump, you know, the importance of the Democratic uh, endorsement. I think it's, you know, she's much more in touch with Goleta. We've had um, Santa Barbans who would be the representatives of the second district. We had Josh Williams, who could forget when he first ran against um, 
Janet. Janet. He thought, oh, I, I, Galita's is in my blood. He got his clock cleaned. <laughs> Um, then we had Dan Secord from Hope Ranch by way of Santa Barbara thinking, I can represent Kalita. They said, take a hike. We don't want you. And I think that there's Susan something... Rose was the last uh, Santa Barbara, right? There's something very peculiar and specific about Kalita that that district wants and needs. And I think Greg will have a harder time than he imagines sort of inserting himself in there. Yeah. All right. We're, real quick, I have one question. I, I interviewed Hart, and um, he told me that his decision to run for supervisor came only after the, uh, the natural disaster in Montecito. Isn't it a fact that he was running around uh, uh, gathering support back in November and December? You would suspect that since he raised so much money for his city council race against a no-name that... Um, he had intentions of higher office. Before any, Before maybe there was any maybe he, maybe he read the weather forecast. Maybe yeah. he should work unlike, for an emergency. Un, unlike the sheriff. Okay. Kelsey, his name is Jack Uchiferi. <laughs> <laughs> is that how you pronounce it? Is it Uchiferi? Uchiferi, yes. Oh, okay. oh that's the first See, time we've heard that. Reporting on the B, you <laughs> learn how to pronounce people's names. And that, <laughs> that is man's name. Josh, speaking of... <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Golita, uh, you're pretty much of a Choo Choo fan, I guess. Uh, you got the ex <laughs> you got the world exclusive on the on that can be the long awaited commuter train, a, a lane and a train. We were we were promised many years ago by SB CAG representative Greg Hart and and others, and we finally got the train. What's what's happening? Well, I noticed that nobody from the Independent was at the. Uh, UCSB, Goleta, uh, town and gown uh, meeting. So I got the scoop on the on the rail. Did you know this was happening? Uh, I was not paying attention. Okay, all right. Um, at this meeting, Michael Bennett. You did have an exclusive. I did have an exclusive. Michael Bennett talked about how they were very close to starting in April this train coming from Ventura to Santa Barbara to Goleta. And this has been a dream of alternative transportation activists. Okay, wait, wait. Michael Bennett said it. Did anybody from the railroad company say it? Union Pacific? Have they confirmed this? We have been hearing from other people that this is happening for a long time. Yes. Well, as I reported, there was a follow-up <laughs> interview. There was a follow-up story at the uh, SBCAG subcommittee. Yeah. Where we were there. Pacific Surf was You were not there. No, it was Gene Yamamura was there. Oh, okay. okay. I thought you meant we as in you, know, you and Kelsey, but okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, so Pacific Surfliner, they've confirmed that the plan is to have a train come from L.A. They had to use Measure A money. They're going to open Union Station earlier, 4.09 a.m., so the train has to leave earlier. This has been a challenge for figuring out a way to retime the train for years. It's going to go to Ventura, it's going to go to Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, Goleta. They're going to do a pilot project. It's starting April 2nd. There's one more formal approval that needs to happen next week. However, um, everyone sort of feels that it's going to it's, it's going So to go what forward. happened? What, what, because this has been impossible. I mean, I remember when um, Michael Dukakis was enlisted to try to break the log jam. I mean, people have been working on this forever. What happened to make this? Well, it's not the final solution. Fortunately, okay. all of our viewers know who Michael Dukakis <laughs> is because they're all over the age of 70. But anyway. Uh, it's, how did this happen? It's sort of a piece of the greater goal, which it was they finally got Union Pacific, Pacific Surfliner, Amtrak. How did they Metro, do that? Well, lots was of Was it because of Montecito? No, it had nothing to do with uh, the no? Montecito really? debris flow. This was already in the works. It was already going to happen. Hmm. Lots of talk, lots of negotiations. Measure A money is going to be used to open the train earlier, along with some state money, open the Union Station. So the thing is, it's one train. Okay? It's getting to Santa Barbara at 645. It's getting to Goleta at 715. It's one car, what is that, 20 people? No, it's going to seat up to 500 people, but meaning it's up. It's it's one train in the sense of the goal of 101 in motion, <clears throat> and the goal of um, Measure A was uh, two trains, 
two trains to come in the morning. So this is sort of the, the first step, but it's a big deal. It's a huge it's, deal. It's going to allow <coughs> many because people. It's a big deal because of the principal or because of the number of people? Well, have you ever tried to get from Ventura to Santa Barbara in the morning? No. Right? Why would I leave Santa Barbara? You can afford to live here, <laughs> yes. You because of your vacation rentals, right? You're able to afford I mean, so. You know, Anne Marie got, let me tell you. <laughs> so fourteen thousand so, people come to Santa Barbara to work right, every day. I've Santa heard Barbara that. and Galita. This is gonna alleviate some of that congestion and some of that traffic. It's just a start, but it is a Big deal, and the Pacific so two Surf trains would be like a thousand people. What's that? About seven percent less. I don't know. Kelsey's the mathematician at the table. Right. Seven, seven That's and a right. half percent. Okay. So, so this is a big deal. Of course, the alternative transportation's what people want more. It's a pilot project. They're going to see what ridership is, and then try to expand it going forward. Is there a train going the other way then? Do they? Yeah, so it's coming back from Goleta at 4.25 p.m. It's going to hit Santa Barbara at 4.40. They have not figured out the Carpinteria time. That's something they have to work with. They're going to do a massive marketing campaign once this thing is finalized next Wednesday. Everybody's going to know about it. And the cool thing is that SB CAG, using Measure A money, is going to pay for people to ride in the month of April. So it's going to be free. For free or is it going to be just for days? It was just the MTD bus. For free. The entire... Yeah. Oh, oh man! And, what? Then, and then after that, you, wow. can, there, well, you thought just the bus was free. Yeah. So what really ch changed here? I mean, there has to have been something. I mean, people have been talking for a long time. What broke the log jam? I don't know, but I look forward to reading about it in the poodle, Nick. Yeah. All right. It's <laughs> probably Greg Hart, right? I mean, it's <laughs> oh, jeez. Was it Handback Jackson? <laughs> no. My theory is it was, it was uh, Charlie Munger. Push your bet. Charlie okay. Munger? Yeah. Really? Why he wants to take the it's train? It's a complete whoop it out thin air theory uh, based on the fact that Union Pacific <laughs> is headquartered and in... And that's why you tune in. In <laughs> Omaha, and he is from Omaha. I'll tell you oh. what. I'll, I'll tell you what changed. <laughs> <laughs> My dad is from Omaha. Maybe well, he's coming back. Well, there you Another factor. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> another key factor. Walter is in action. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, wait, hold on, Nick. I will tell you what changed. If you can tell me why Randy Rouse changed his vote. Well, I already told you that. that was, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, that cover story. Okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, the poodle this week is all about offshore oil drilling and the fact that we have to deal with this again. This has been a settled issue for how many decades? Uh, well, this is sort of a big middle finger from the Trump administration to the great state of California. But it isn't just... California. Uh, Trump and Ryan Zinke, a sometime Santa Barbara resident and um, Secretary of Interior, have decided they want to achieve global energy dominance. And uh, that is the term they use. And to, to that end, they're opening up every square inch of federal coastal waters to new offshore oil leasing. And well, this, they're trying to. They're okay. trying to. They have announced that's what they're going to do. So what they've done, they've sort of, this week, well, earlier they, we had this sort of starting gun for, okay, we're going to start the process. And what happened this week, there was a meeting uh, to this, you know, it was the public's chance to respond and say what they thought of it. <clears throat> for the entire state of California with 900 miles of coast, the federal government said we're going to have one hearing. It's going to be in Sacramento where there isn't any coast. We're going to have it in a library um, we're going to have long lines outside, but we're going to let people in by threes and sixes. And instead of a hearing which people understand in any sense of the word, where people show up, they get in the seats, there's somebody at the podium who declaims unto whomever, uh, they, you come in and there's listening tables and they greet you and they whisper listening tables. they have little listening stations after you euphemism? after you it's watch kind of what we after you here. watch a nice little video about they why, make you see the video you watch the video as to why opening up the lease sales is a good idea to achieve hmm. global energy dominance and then you get to to comment on it and so you you meet with these people and they're very nice and very well behaved and they help you find how you can type in your comments into a computer. Which they, go nowhere. Well, they go to the Department of, I don't know, uh, BOEM, Bureau of Energy uh, Management, 
which is a subset of the Department of Interior. And when I talked with John Romero, who is the head of the regional office here, he said that about 65,000 emails had been received, but that was Tuesday, so probably a little bit more. The, the, I guess the key question is, at the listening tables, are there talking sticks? Do you have to hold a talking stick at the listening table? We should do that. I think that would be good. <laughs> I think the idea of this, I mean, this is a, a whole lot of, you know, uh, spinning, nothing is going to come of it. The state of California. Nothing is going to come of it. Not here. The state of California Lands Commission said, you can do what you want. They put the oil companies on notice. You can do whatever you want, but let me tell you what. If you try to get your oil from federal waters past our waters three in the miles state, out. three miles out, it past our waters and onto shore, we aren't going to approve your proposal. It's already, it's mm. pre-dead. Well, not to mention they're dismantling Venico. Right. I mean... Right. What, 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 what's the reaction of the environmental community? Is it just like eye rolling or hitting your forehead, or I mean, what? Are, I mean, is, is you have to. We have to just geared up. I mean, I think we saw, yeah, we, no, but I think we saw this coming with the election. I mean, yeah. so it, they're geared up and they and they know what to do, right? I mean, they had seven, eight hundred people go to uh, Sacramento for this hearing. Um, there was a meeting on um, Tuesday night at the Faulkner Gallery. And there was about 150, 200 people there mm -hmm. all to express their outrage about it. So uh, for Environmental Defense Center, this is a great organizing tool. Yeah. Uh, Linda Kropp was, you know, out there and um, they, they have made this a, a big priority and um, I think they're getting traction. But it's going nowhere, you predict. I mean, I think that it's going to take a long time to get nowhere, but in the meantime, you can't go wrong by beating up the oil industry. Um, a recent survey, they've been doing surveys of Californians and what they think about offshore oil development. Should we do it, should we not, since 2003? Every year they do the same survey. 2017, the gap, you know, it was like 70%, 75% said they oppose it. 25% says they support it. It's a little bit less than that opposing it, but it's the widest margin ever. Will the, will the state gas tax, the vast new state gas tax, have any effect on it, do you think? It, I'm sure it'll be used. I mean, it'll be unpopular, and when people feel the impacts, they will be more inclined to complain. Okay. All right. Well, we'll follow that at every step of the way since it's going. No worries. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Okay, and thanks to tonight's panel, uh, Laura Capps, Kelsey Brueger, Josh Molina, and Nick Welsh, and thank you for watching. Uh, please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, where you can check out my blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and beyond, and our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of our past shows and special interviews. Thanks to our director, Oscar Gutierrez, to our crew, Ryan, Ase, Susie, and Ken. And, as always, our top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy senior executive producer, Hap Freund. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.